Well, good morning. It's great to have another opportunity to share with you this morning. You know, I, I was reading the other day something where someone claimed that the birth of Jesus was the most significant event in human history. Look, I understand this time of year in particular, there's emphasis placed on the birth of Jesus, and I'm all right with that. And it certainly is a significant event. I mean, it's the Word becoming flesh, God dwelling among us. We cannot deny the unequivocal importance of the birth of Jesus. But I wouldn't say that it's the most significant event in human history. As we continue on this theme of apologetics, I want to talk about what was the most significant event in human history, and that is the resurrection of our Lord. Journey with me for a minute. The year A.D. 60, the place, the palace of Herod Agrippa II in Caesarea by the sea. The setting, the Apostle Paul has been jailed for two years. And now he stands in chains before the mighty Agrippa, great-grandson of Herod the Great, the malevolent king who attempted to butcher the baby boys in Bethlehem. And Paul's case has been referred to Agrippa by Festus, who confesses he cannot understand the charges against Paul. With his Roman background, Festus cannot comprehend why the Jews hate Paul and why Paul keeps talking about a dead man named Jesus, who Paul claimed was alive. There in that one sentence is the whole problem of the resurrection. Look, Paul believed it. The Jews didn't believe it. And the Romans just couldn't understand it. The Jews said Jesus was dead. Paul said that he was alive and poor Festus doesn't have a clue. And so he passes the case along to Agrippa for review. Paul's explanation to the king is very simple. He affirms that as a Jew and as a Pharisee, he shares in the hope of what God had promised to the Jewish people. Those promises were so great that of necessity they went beyond the grave. That is, the promises cross the generations and assume that God will raise his believing people. And then Paul, he asks a question, a question that resonates across the centuries. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? What a question. Is it truly incredible? And the Greek word here is says against belief. Is it truly against belief that God should raise the dead? Which is more reasonable? That God raises the dead or that God does not raise the dead? This doctrine of the resurrection was troublesome from the very beginning. In Acts chapter 4, verse 2, it tells us that in the earliest days, the Christian movement uh the Jewish leaders, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And for many, it is still troublesome today. You know, unbelief always has a thousand excuses. Some people refuse to believe that God raises the dead because they have never seen it happen, and they only believe what they see. Others say, I can't do it. I don't know anyone that can do it. Therefore, I don't think that it can happen. We, of course, live in an age of science and reason. But is it incredible, against belief, to believe that God raises the dead and raised Jesus Christ? In the theme of apologetics, we could have a whole lesson on was Jesus real. But the truth is, there are so many reliable historical sources and references to Jesus outside of the scriptures that only an unreasonable skeptic would dare say he didn't exist. 
And so for that reason, I'd rather focus on the more extraordinary. Did he die and come back to life? So many today think Christianity is unreasonable, not just because they don't want to believe in God, but because they can't allow themselves to believe in the resurrection, believe that a human died and then came back to life. But to us Christians, the resurrection is the linchpin of the Christian faith. Paul says to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. It is in vain because the resurrection proves Jesus defeated our greatest enemies, sin and death, once and for all. The resurrection is the undeniable proof that Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross actually accomplished something for sinful humanity. Not only that, but it validates all that Jesus said about himself as the Messiah, one who would suffer, die, and rise. In his undoing of death, Christ proves that he, not sin, not death, is the true victor. The resurrection reverses the damage that was done in the garden, and it gives real, concrete life to all. Because the resurrection of Jesus has been denied from many sides, there are those who deny the resurrection on certain scientific assumptions. That because we don't see dead people resurrecting today, therefore it could never happen. There have been other theories, such as Jesus only swooned or fainted or was in a coma, and he didn't actually die and that he was revived in the cold tomb, or that Mary Magdalene, who was somehow love-struck and a little crazy, thought she saw Jesus because she really wanted to, but she only saw the gardener, or that the women approached the tomb in the dark and they couldn't see, and they went to the wrong tomb, or that all the disciples were the victims of a mass hallucination, or that the Jews or the Romans or the disciples themselves stole the body. But I think what you find if you review the evidence without bias, is a simple life-changing fact. Jesus truly did resurrect from the grave. So this morning, let's spend some time reviewing five facts that I think strongly support proof of a resurrected Christ. The first point to consider has to do with the narratives that we find in the four Gospels. And let's remember from our previous study that these writings are historical writings. It's not just a book for Christianity. They were real people writing historical documents that we have record of. Have you ever seen a, a television show where there's a group of people that they've committed a crime and then they conspire together to lie about it? One of the tall tale signs that make it look suspicious is that they all sound identical. They all sound the same. And when every detail is exactly the same, that's usually a flag to detectives that the story is contrived and they're hiding something. The gospel accounts do not have the contrived and conspired harmony to them. They don't contradict each other, yet they appear to be independent accounts. An author by the names of James Montgomery Boyce writes this, he says, a first important evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that of the resurrection narratives themselves. There are four of them, one in each gospel. They are more or less independent, yet they are also harmonious, and that suggests their reliability as historical documents. He continues to add, if four people had sat down together and said, let's invent an account of a resurrected Jesus Christ, and had then worked out the details of their stories, there would be far more agreement than we find in the Gospels. We would not find the many small apparent contradictions, yet if the story were not true and they had somehow separately made it up, it is impossible that we should have a central agreement that we do find. In other words, the nature of the narratives is what we would expect from four separate accounts prepared by eyewitnesses. Now, there are certain details with which a shallow read of the accounts create problems. Just the sort of problems, though, 
that you would not find in a story that had been ironed out. Just the sorts of problems given if people were giving accounts independently of other accounts and not trying to make their account and story fit with someone else's. For example, there are a variety of statements about the moment at which the women first arrived at the tomb. Matthew says that it was toward the dawn of the first day of the week. Mark says that it was very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen. Luke says that it was at early dawn. John says that it was still dark. Now these phrases are the kind of things the authors would have standardized if they were working together on their accounts. But they're not really contradictions. For one thing, although John says that it was still dark, he obviously does not mean that it was pitch black, because the next phrase says that Mary Magdalene saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Presumably, the women started out while it was dark, but they arrived at the garden as the day was breaking. So another example is one which has caused people to doubt the resurrection accounts. Some think that the gospel accounts give different stories and that one emphasizes a group of women, but another just Mary Magdalene. However, I think if you have two independent accounts who are not trying to be exhaustive, but are focusing on different aspects of the same event, and are not trying to harmonize their accounts, but give their own eyewitness account, you expect this sort of variety. And we need to test the accounts to see if they contradict or if they correspond and they build each other up. Boyce highlights and says that a second example of variation in detail in the midst of essential harmony is the listing of the women who made the visit to the garden. So Matthew says that there were two Marys, Mary Magdalene and another Mary. Mark writes that Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome Luke refers to Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them. John mentions only Mary Magdalene. These are examples where one reference throws light on the others. Mark and Luke, for example, explain who Matthew's other Mary was. And when we put them together, we find that on that morning, when it was still dark, at least five women set out for the tomb. Mary Magdalene, who's mentioned by each of the writers, Mary the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, and at least one other unnamed woman. And this woman fits the Luke narrative to other women, and that includes Salome. The purpose of their trip is to anoint Christ's body, and they already know of the difficulty they face, for the tomb had been sealed by a large stone, and they have no idea how they're going to move it. It begins to lighten a little bit as they travel, and so they finally draw close to the tomb, and they see that the stone has been moved. Now, that is something that they weren't expecting, so although it suits their purpose, they're nevertheless upset, and they're uncertain of what to do. Apparently, they send Mary Magdalene back to tell Peter and John about the new development which John himself records, although he does not mention the presence of the other women, and we see that in John 22. As the women wait for her to return, the morning grows lighter, and eventually, emboldened by daybreak, the women go forward, and now they see the angels, and they're sent back to the city by them to, the, to tell the other disciples. In the meantime, Mary Magdalene has found Peter and John, who immediately leave her behind and run to the tomb. And John records their view of the grave clothes and points out that it was at this moment that he personally believed. Finally, Mary Magdalene arrives back at the tomb again and is the first to see Jesus. Now, on the same day, Jesus also appears to the other women as they're returning from the tomb, to Peter, to the Amos disciples, and to the others that are gathered together in the evening in Jerusalem. But another factor points to the reliability of these gospel accounts. And it points to the fact that they're not contrived accounts, but they're written to help us understand the full picture. 
First, many of the disciples are described as not recognizing Jesus, that they doubted reports and were mistaken about his identity. For instance, Mary in the garden, the disciples on the Emus Road, Thomas, John. Now, if you were constructing an argument for a lie with a group of people, you would, you would absolutely leave out the fact of these detrimental details. You would not admit that you actually didn't recognize the person. However, if you were giving an honest account regarding an indisputable fact, these are just the sort of reports that you would expect to hear and see in an account. The second, and although I know this isn't PC in 2021, if you're contriving an account of a resurrection to be believed in the ancient world, you would not make your first witness a woman. Because in those days, in a court of law, a woman's testimony would not have been counted. And so this is a weakness for the critics. So we can see that the four gospel accounts, these gospel resurrection narratives, support the fact of being actual written detailed accounts of the resurrection of Jesus. Second fact I want us to look at is some external sources. A writer by name of Gary Habermas has done some writing on the issue of historical method, and he speaks about different types of historical evidences that we find and their value in establishing facts for history. And regarding the sources for the resurrection of Christ and his appearance to his disciples after his resurrection, this is what Gary writes. Beyond these six writings, the Gospels, Acts, 1 Corinthians, there are almost two dozen others from the ancient world that record well over 100 aspects from the life of Jesus. And for those who like non-Christian sources, 17 fall into that category. Of these, about a half a dozen, most notably ancient historians Josephus and Phlegon, record that Jesus appeared to his followers after his death. Such multiple attestations from about every possible category of data is also without parallel in the ancient world. There are no external sources that speak of Jesus as not having died and resurrected. The external sources only confirm what is reflected in biblical accounts. For most of what we know about the ancient world, it comes from maybe one or two sources of information. For example, most of what we know about Alexander the Great comes from one source, the historian named Livy, who was writing about four centuries after Alexander the Great lived, and that's not untypical for history. Yet for the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus, there are multiple ancient sources inside and outside of the New Testament confirming and corroborating the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the risen Christ. And that's just an avalanche of historical data. Third fact, the empty tomb. One of the main pieces of evidence is the empty tomb itself. Jesus died, was buried, and his body was no longer there. The empty tomb has been seen as a problem by many people because if it's true, it points to a resurrection. So there have to be a number of theories devised. One theory is that the women went to the wrong tomb because they couldn't see in the dark. However, this, this theory is immensely weak because the disciples Peter and John also went to the tomb during the daytime and they found it empty. And if at any point the Jewish authorities wanted to show that Jesus was in fact still dead and they could have merely produced the body from the correct tomb, so it just never happened. The second is the theory that the Jews or the Romans stole the body and they hid it. Now, of course, various things work against this theory. First, the Jews and the Romans at no point produced the body when the uh, apostles began preaching that Jesus had been resurrected. They just don't do it. And second, it would have been counterproductive to their various causes to provoke the disciples to falsely believe that Jesus was risen. And so they could have countered that by showing where his body actually was. The Jews were trying to keep the Jewish populace in control 
as were the Romans. And third, the, you have difficulty of grave robbers, right? Grave robbers going in, stealing the body, but taking the time to unwrap the grave clothes and leave them behind. All of this while the Romans are outside guarding the tomb. The third theory that people make up is that the disciples stole the body. Either the women or the other disciples. Now this view is, a, is given a little attention when you realize that what would happen to a guard? What would happen to a Roman guard who left his post or who fell asleep or lost his charge? It's the death penalty. The death penalty was handed out for neglect and duty. And that ensured that the guards were attentive. Their lives depended on it. And we have no account of the guards being strong-armed or no charges brought against the disciples for anything like this. Also, if we're going to believe that these disciples deliberately stole the body and lied, we have to go further and hypothesize that all the apostles were willing to die and be beaten for that lie. And that all other 500 witnesses mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 were mistaken. Another theory was that Jesus, uh, they have this view that Jesus just swooned on the cross. He fainted. He didn't actually die. And he revived due to the cool of the tomb and the smell of the spices that were in there when he was buried. That somehow after Jesus was in the tomb, that he shook himself loose from the grave clothes, that he rolled away the stone, escaped the attention of the guards, and was able, able to make his disciples believe that he had conquered death. Being able to suddenly appear in a room, keep his identity revealed in plain sight. There's a writer named John Stott, and this is what he writes about that theory. He says, are we to believe that after the rigors of pain and trial, mockery, flogging, and crucifixion, Jesus could have survived 36 hours in a stone sepulcher with neither warmth nor food nor medical care, that he could then rally sufficiently to perform the superhuman feat of shifting the boulder which secured the mouth of the tomb, and this without disturbing the Roman guard, that then, weak and sickly and hungry, he could appear to his disciples in such a way as to give the impression that he had died and risen, could send them into all the world and promise to be with them until the end of time, that he could live somewhere hidden for 40 days, making occasional surprise appearances, and then finally disappear without any explanation? Such credulity is more incredible than Thomas's unbelief. The Romans, the Romans who were masters and perfectors of crucifixion, experienced army men who had seen death and been trained to kill. These were the ones who had killed Christ and confirmed his death to Pilate. There is no historical record anywhere of anyone surviving a Roman crucifixion. The fact that Christ's legs did not need to be broken to speed his death, that he was stabbed with a spear to confirm his death, and that his body was released upon the word of the officer in charge, we should not doubt that he did not that he did in fact die. The resurrection gives the best accounting for the empty tomb. Another theory to consider are the grave clothes. You know, when, when Peter and John arrived because of Mary's report, the tomb was empty but for the grave clothes. Of special interest to us is John's account. Because John says that he has believed when he saw the grave clothes. In John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10, this is what we read. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, and while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon, Peter, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there 
and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. But then the disciples went back to their homes. What made John believe when he saw the grave clothes? John's account indicates to us the way Jesus was buried. He appears to have been buried in the typical style of burial for that day. The body was wrapped in linen clothes from the top of the arms to the soles of the feet. The shoulders, neck, and face were exposed. And then a type of turban was placed around his head. And you'll notice in verses 6 and 7 that the two parts of the linen are still lying there intact, but there's no body inside them. It appears as if the body had been passed through the grave clothes without disturbing them. So there's now a gap where the neck and the face once were, and the turban is still folded as if worn. And when John saw this, he knew a miracle had happened. We're told he did not know it had happened or what had happened or what extraordinary prophecy had been fulfilled, but that the appearance of the grave clothes alone led John to believe that a miracle of a resurrection had happened. It's been pointed out that John's account gives the impression not just of an eyewitness, but of a careful observer. He notes that it was dark, that they were running, that John run fast, ran faster, that Peter looked in first, that the grave clothes were still folded. These are details that draw our attention to the peculiar detail of the grave clothes. And it's been pointed out that they would have been wrapped and stuffed with a, a sticky substance and a lot of powdered spices. And if someone had actually tried to steal the body, unwrap it, and rewrap them, that it would have just been a big mess. But what John saw did not lead him to think that someone was playing a prank, but rather that God had done a miracle of a resurrection. Let's look at a fourth fact. The post-resurrection appearances. I'm not going to go through these, but consider the historical records of those who admitted Jesus appeared to them alive after his death. There are many. You know, there's a somewhat large group of people in this world today that think the world is flat. And they're known as flat earthers. I've watched some interviews with them, and their leading argument, the earth is flat, is they believe they're being lied to so that space agencies like NASA can continue to get money. To me, however, there's one glaring hole in their theory. They want you to believe that of the thousands of people who have worked at places like NASA and SpaceX, and of the hundreds of people who have gone to space, that they're all lying. That not one of them has cracked to tell the truth that the world is flat. I just can't buy that. There's no way if the earth was flat that one, just one of those thousands of people wouldn't have told someone, wrote a book about it, or somehow exposed the lie. I believe these people who saw Jesus alive are the same. This isn't just one person like John Smith for the Mormons who claim to have this experience. This is literally hundreds of eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus, who not only testified about seeing him, but in some cases gave their life and death holding to that truth. We have history that tells us that all of the apostles, in some way or another, suffered and died because they wouldn't deny the risen Christ. Not one of them, not one, recanted. Which leads to my final fact. One of the most powerful facts, the transformed disciples. You know, various disciples were dramatically affected by the resurrection. And this, to me, is the greatest testament of the resurrected Lord. Consider Peter, who had denied Christ, yet is preaching boldly at Pentecost. A man who had failed who had entertained the possibility of going back to his old life of fishing, but was then restored by Christ to the ministry. Or consider Thomas, 
the Lord's brother, or Thomas, we know of, we know of Thomas's doubt that he refused to believe unless he saw things with his own eyes. And when he saw, he gives us one of the most profound professions of Christ as God in the scriptures. Now the Lord's brother, James, who during Christ's life did not believe. However, after his appearance, we see that James becomes one of the leaders in the fledgling church of Acts, or Paul. Paul, a man who was well-educated, zealous, and bent on destroying what he was already convinced was a blasphemous and dangerous movement. But when Christ appeared to him on the Damascus Road, we see he does a 180 turn, and he begins preaching the very Christ he was bent on denying. It's not as if they benefited from this. They didn't get giant houses or Rolex watches. They gave up everything and died for this truth. Add to this the holy lives lived, the selling of property, the willingness to end the Jewish exclusion and include Gentiles as equal covenant members, the commitment to missions, the willingness to be martyred for Christ. All of these truths bear overwhelming testimony to the Bible's claim that Jesus is risen from the dead. And if we take all that evidence and we put it all together as a cumulative case and we test it by all other theories, the best explanation of the evidence is that Christ rose from the dead and he was observed by the witnesses. This is the most plausible explanation. I hope you can see the intelligibility of the Christian position. It is not intellectual suicide to believe Christ rose from the dead. It's actually pretty reasonable. Paul tells the Athenians in Acts 17, 30 through 31, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. You cannot hear these facts and say, oh, well, that's interesting. And then go on as if nothing has happened. Because if Christ has risen, we will rise from the dead to stand before God to give an account of our life. All sin will be punished. Do we think we will go unpunished before the perfect judge who never reneges on justice? Do we think we will be seen as a good person by the one who can read our mind and has seen all of our secret intentions and actions? There's no hope for a sinner like me to stand on judgment day and be found innocent. I know that. This is why Christ died and resurrected. He died to pay our sins debts and rose to give us eternal life. And he is calling us to stop sinning to bow the knee to him. He is willing to grant amnesty and forgiveness to all who are willing to receive him, their God and Savior. The resurrection proves all of this to be true. I hope this message was beneficial. I hope it encouraged you. And most importantly, I hope it confirmed in you that Jesus is the Christ, the risen Lord. If you have a decision to make, we invite you forward as we stand and as we sing.